Good morning, everyone. And I mean everyone. And we have lots of people online as well, so good morning to all of you who are joining us in our worship service. Just a few brief announcements. Um, this is the first Sunday of the month, and it is our Communion Sunday. So for those of you who are visitors and guests, the way we usually do it is Marie and I will stand down there with the bread and the juice, and we invite you to come and receive the elements. So a line forms down the center aisle. Or if you prefer, there are cups in the back. You can take communion in your pew uh, as well. So um, this morning we have very we have many guests, but a very special guest. Uh, Thomas Harley is here. He brought his mom this morning, Stephanie. Um, I, th I think maybe she wants to make sure that he's behaving himself this morning. So we're glad to have her here. Their entire family play hockey, even Stephanie. So we have a female hockey player in our midst as well. But Thomas right now is the only one who's playing in the National Hockey League. So um, they were um, my parishioners at Rockefeller a number of years ago and very glad to have uh, them here this morning. Um, one other announcement is the prayer list, I believe, is up to date, and we did get word from Ann Crocker, who is online with us this morning, uh, wanting us to pass along uh, thanks to you for uh, the cards and the notes that you have sent her following her surgery and her rehab. So now I'd invite all of us to join in the call to worship that's printed for us in our bulletins. Let us seek the Lord so that he may be found. Let us call upon the Lord who is near. And in turn, what does God require of us? To be just in all our dealings with others, to demonstrate constant love, and to be humble in God's presence. Our opening hymn is number 568, Christ for the World We Sing. May we all pray together. We thank you, O oh gracious God, for calling us into your church to be your people. As we hear your call, empower us to faithfully serve you in both worship and outreach. May our humility always and everywhere overcome our pride. In the name of Jesus, we pray. 
Amen. So before we invite the kids and the youth to come to the front, I'm going to invite Thomas if he'd come and join me. I first met Thomas when he was like this. He would come to the front as part of our children's time. There is that infamous story, that urban legend, about the time that we did a skit with David and Goliath. And Thomas, little Thomas was David, who slayed Goliath, who was the biggest parishioner we had in our congregation. So now he towers over me. And uh, he was here last year, and we asked for some questions from the audience. Problem is, nobody wants to ask the first question. So it was a little bit awkward. So Thomas, we got the questions ahead of time, this time. So before we have the kids come up, here's the adult participation in children's time. What is the most exciting arena in which to play other than your home ice in Dallas? Um, Vegas is pretty cool. They get that place rocking. Um, and then Edmonton this past year in playoffs. It was the loudest I've ever heard. I could be yelling at Pastor John right in his face. He couldn't hear me, so it was pretty cool. So Las Vegas. Do you keep in touch with your teammates during the off season? Yeah, um, you know, we're just friends like any other people. You FaceTime them, see what they're doing, uh, play around of golf with them, nothing crazy. A related question. Do your teammates have a nickname for you? And if so, what is it? Uh, hockey players are not the most creative people. Um, <laughs> so my nickname is Harles. Uh, in the past, though, I have got T-Bone. That's the best one. Does your body ever grow weary because of travel practices and games? Very much so, yes. <laughs> How many miles do you think you skate per game? Uh, they actually track it. Um, so it's a big game would be like three and a half, four miles up and down the ice. Four miles of, of skating. This one is my question. Oh boy. I want to be your team chaplain. Can you make that happen? <laughs> I don't think I have enough pull for that one just yet. <laughs> Only after one year, probably yeah. not. But, but, but keep that in mind because I don't need to stay here forever. And probably right now, they wouldn't allow me that much time to come back and forth to Dallas anyway. So, now we're going to invite all the kids and the youth to come to the front and probably just seat themselves in this area here. So, come on up. is played on ice yes. and there are goals like that one only they're much bigger and everyone is trying to put the puck in the net and the other team is trying to prevent you from putting the puck in the net it's really an exciting game and it moves really really fast and sometimes the Dallas games are on TV here so you can someday look and find Thomas on the ice usually in his green jersey but sometimes white or black and the number 55 on the back so how did thomas get where he is now well thomas has had a lot of help wouldn't you say his parents perhaps even his siblings uh, friends schoolmates uh, colleagues uh, teammates 
coaches, a lot of people have helped Thomas get to where he is today, playing in the most elite league anywhere in the world, the very best league. But also, Thomas is where he is now because of his work ethic, because he practices and practices and practices, and there's lots of discipline in his life. And now he becomes, now after his first full year with the Dallas Stars, now he's about ready to go back to training camp for second year. And so we're all glad for his success and for his progress. And uh, we invited him to come this morning and he so graciously uh, said yes that he would come. So Thomas is holding kind of a small hockey stick. His hockey stick is way bigger than that one. And I thought that maybe, maybe the way to do this is to allow some of you to take that hockey stick and try to shoot the puck into the net. And Thomas will help you with where you should put your hands. Now, I have some names here that I want to have an opportunity to shoot, but I'm not gonna ask the big ones because otherwise <coughs> Billy might be ducking his head over there behind the organ. So we're just gonna have the littlest ones of you shoot. So, um, Juliet. I have you on my list. Why don't you get up and Thomas will help you with a stick and you're going to try to shoot the puck into the net. Which hand do you write with? Right one? All right. Take that stick. Two hands on it. Okay. Then take the puck. Stand this way. Back in the net. There it is. Here. All right. The next one's Harrison. So Juliet, you can sit down and we'll let Harrison go next. What hand do you write? You know what's going on, huh? Go for it. Oh, no, no. Okay, Harrison. All right, all right, thank you. Carter, where are you? You're next. Not so easy, not so easy. And Clara. So thank you for that. So you get an idea of what the game is about. Thomas is a defenseman. His job is to keep the opposing players from putting the puck in the net. So he uses his stick, his body, whatever he needs to do to help that happen. So what we have done is we have t-shirts for most of you and on the back is Thomas's name and his number. So we're going to give you the t-shirts and some of you arrived at the last minute that we didn't know were coming, but our promise is that we will get shirts for you with Thomas's name and number on the back so that everybody here has a shirt. So if you just be a little bit patient and we'll call your name and you can come up and we'll get your shirt on. So Juliet, Harrison's next. Come on, Harrison. Oops, turn around. Miller. <laughs> this is why we need an assistant. Here you go. Uh, Wendy, where did you get?
get to. I have one for Reed. Okay. Okay. Oh yeah, you got it on backwards. Thomas's name goes on the back. Okay, Clara? And we have one for Alexandra. Carter? Where are you, Carter? <laughs> there you go. Willa? Oops. Oh, hold on. It's kind of There you go. There you go. Josh? You're going to go put your own one, right? <laughs> and Trevor? Gracie. Who? Gracie. Oh, Gracie? No, Greg, Gracie isn't here this morning, uh, but we have Isabel. Brian? You want to come up front with these guys, Brian? <laughs> we have Henry. Um, Henry, you want to come up? For now, how about Thomas? Did you bring your? You have your jersey with you? I do have my jersey. It's back there. Am I putting it up? Okay, Mom will bring it up. Yep. So what we wanted to do was take a picture with everybody wearing their shirt. And we want to take a picture with everybody facing that way, and then a picture with everybody turned around. So can we do that? We everybody stand up, and you guys maybe can make the second row there. <laughs> Michelle's going to get a get a picture, so everybody get in tight. Now, how about everybody turn around? Okay. Thank you. Well, we now have the newest chapter of the Thomas Carly Fan Club. So, thank you all for coming. for everybody. Thomas is going to be signing these pots for some of the kids to take home too. So thank you. Thomas, thank you for, uh, for your morning and for being a good ambassador to the sport. Okay. <laughs>
And John, this is by no means a solo this morning, is it? Paul is writing a letter to one of is it this was the church in the city of Corinth and he's talking about his preaching and about his journeys as a missionary and then he closes this ninth chapter with these words all this I do for the gospel's sake in order to share in its blessings surely you know 
that many runners take part in a race, but only one of them wins the prize. Run then in such a way as to win the prize. Every athlete in training submits to strict discipline in order to be crowned with a wreath that will not last. But we do it for one that will last forever. That is why I run straight for the finish line. That is why I am like a boxer who does not waste his punches. I harden my body with blows and bring it under complete control to keep myself from being disqualified after having called others to the contest. Let's prepare to pray together. We gather yet again to worship you, Almighty God, grateful for this building we call the church, grateful also for the people we call the church, and knowing full well that you are with us at all times and in all places. You are the all-powerful, all-knowing, ever-present one. You are beside us all the while, in whatever place we find ourselves. We're reminded that your grace and blessings are forever offered us. We are comforted and encouraged by being together, whether in these pews or at a distance. The symbols, the sacrament, the music, your holy word sustain and guide us. As we, this family of faith, gather in your name, thanks be to you for bringing us together and grateful for the sharing of this sacrament together in remembrance of your mighty acts through Jesus the Christ. We offer ourselves to you in praise and thanksgiving. May we be the body of Christ in today's world. Hear this, our prayer we ask, and now hear us as we pray together silently. Jesus reminds us that as we gather together, we pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We'll now receive our morning offering.
grant you the work to which they are devoted. May always prosper under your guidance. Our hymn is number 454. Both as a Jesus so often spoke in metaphors. The lilies of the field, the lost sheep, a hidden treasure, a mustard seed. But when the apostle Paul took the gospel to the urban world of the Greeks, he employed other metaphors. In the course of Paul's letters, he frequently offers casual references to the world of sports, the arena, the racetrack, wrestling, chariot races, or the boxing ring. The Greek world led the way in sports the original Olympics had started several centuries before Jesus and were held every four years. And even now, all these years later, Summer Olympics are ongoing in Paris. We're inclined to regard Paul as a somewhat dry and sickly scholar, endlessly debating points of theology, but language such as the finishing line, the crown of victory, and the stadium have an important place in his writings. Just maybe we've placed too much emphasis on Paul's reference to the law court and the slave market. Had we paid more attention to the sporting terms, we might have received a different impression of Paul. For him, lessons from the locker room has much to say about Christian living. The first reminder is that victories are won not exclusively on the playing field, but in the locker room and at practice sessions. An athlete is disciplined. Proper foods, drink, rest, 
exercise and conditioning, the freedom to participate in whatever sport is accompanied by disciplines of the body and the mind. Every good athlete must exercise self-control. Practice, practice, and yet more practice. One key to all of life is discipline. Whether in a classroom, or at home, or in the workplace, and even in one's relationship with Jesus, Christian living involves good physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual habits. The life of faith, like that of the athlete, is a life of discipline. W. Somerset Maugham, the great British novelist, went to his typewriter every morning after breakfast. He wasn't wandering through the house trying to find a spot where he would be inspired to write. He went to the same chair, the same desk, the same typewriter, and sat there. His body language told his innermost self, you are the typewriter, you are a writer, now write. And we remember from the Gospels, Jesus went to the synagogue, quote, as was his custom, that is his habit, his practice. The key to all of life is discipline. Victories are won, not just on the playing field, but in the locker room and on the practice fields. And secondly, the importance of a clear-cut sense of direction and purpose. It's important to spend those long, grueling hours of practicing and sharpening one's competitive skills, but it's just as important to run a straight and intentional course. These days we talk about focus, the person who has their life focused, whose intended destination is clear, is more likely to succeed. Lots of people in contemporary society fail to possess a singular purpose. Yet the Apostle Paul had it following his conversion on the road to Damascus. Everything in his life changed in an instant and he became a warrior advocating Jesus. Paul's purpose ordained, he was motivated by nothing other than direction from above. Other than Jesus himself, Paul likely changed more lives than any other single person in history. He accomplished such because this was his calling, the reason he had been born into the world. And 2,000 years later, we're still studying and learning, not only from Jesus, but also from his servant, Paul. And thirdly, to look forward and not backward. Forgetting what is behind, said Paul, I press on. Like Paul, do we fix our eyes on Jesus? Or do we run the race of life looking back over our shoulder? Life bogged down with regrets, grievances, and hurt feelings? Paul had a profound sense of the God to whom he had committed his life. And that God was not some abstraction or vague idea. This God's grace would carry Paul across the finish line, a winner. Winners look ahead. Before they ever head for the track, the pool, the mat, the court, or the field, they view themselves performing flawlessly, clearing the hurdles, mastering the parallel bars, scoring the winning goal. They experience within 
the thrill of winning even before it actually happens in front of crowds of spectators. In those ancient Greek Olympics, winners received a crown made of pine bows and often laced with an herb similar to parsley or celery. But by the time an athlete returned home, his crown was wilting and turning brown. Not so, Paul said, with the crown for which we Christians strive, ours is a crown, he says, that never dies. So Paul, the theologian and the sports fan, draws the parallel between the world of the athlete and the world of faith. And the apostle relies heavily on metaphors from the sports world. He could have drawn from the world of scholarship or from his experiences in leather craft or tent making, or he could have spoken in military jargon. Anyone in the first century would have understood such analogies. Instead, he chose the world of sports. So just like the athlete, as part of our greater Christian community, we remember to commit ourselves to a life of discipline. We remember to focus on a direction that is clear cut. And we remember to run our race with our attention directed to what's ahead. Let's pray together. Always we pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts, O oh Lord, be acceptable in your sight. You who are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. So again, this is the Lord's table. The Methodists don't own it. So you're all welcome to come to the front. And if you'd rather take communion in the pews, there are cups in the back. And I'm sure John will get one too. So welcome, and will you come?
Thank you.